Dom is a um, one. I think you are the creator of F Sharp, I guess. I'm not sure if there is a co credit to be had. Oh, there are many co credits right. for many, many contributors. Yeah. So both are one of the creators of respectively F Sharp and Rust. And, uh, and we will have a discussion on static dynamic aspects in language design taking questions from the audience and um, yeah, with Don, Don Stock. Okay, that, thank you very much, uh, Jan. It's great to, uh, great to be here at, at Rebase in its virtual form. So I was invited along to talk about um, static and dynamic from the perspective uh, of the F sharp language design. So first of all, who am I? What kind of work do I do? I, I've worked at Microsoft Research and now the Microsoft Developer Division for over 20 years now. Uh, what do we do? Microsoft makes tools for nearly every major language. It's a cloud company. It's incredibly highly polyglot. Uh, and Microsoft Research, as we've always you know, in the time I was at Microsoft Research, we had a mission, and we still, they still do, to improve the practice of programming. And there was a lot of work on the sort of crossing over from tech transfer from the academic uh, domain into the industrial domain. Uh, and it's actually because Microsoft makes tools for so many of the world's professional programmers, uh, we made Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, TypeScript, Python tools. There's work on Rust tooling now. Uh, there's work on Java tooling. There's work on, uh, and historically, there's been a lot of work on the .NET family of languages and runtime, which are incredibly important to Microsoft as well. So yeah, I'm best known as being the designer of F Sharp. Uh, I also, in a sense, am a contributor to C Sharp through the design of its generic system, and also indirectly through f -sharp asynchronous programming and a, and a number of other things. And some of these are, of course, being a conduit for ideas coming from other programming languages as well. It's a great place to work, a uh, fascinating point to deliver change into the way we make software uh, that is right across a big spectrum, challenging in many ways because we do so many different things. Uh, so talking about static and dynamic from the f -sharp perspective, I will talk a fair bit about f -sharp type providers because they're kind of uh, different to other things uh, and they kind of give different perspectives on some kind of topics. Uh, and this originally st started from an online discussion about type level programming using constraints in a, in a sort of typical strongly typed constrained generics kind of way. And why I why the F sharp language design doesn't particularly include a very strong type class system in particular, and why it's not going down the route of sort of the that to some extent Scala and Haskell are doing in adding more and more type level constrained type level type level programming using constraints. And I'm going to talk about that mostly at the end, and then we uh, <coughs> Nico and I. Uh, we can we can discuss all sorts of things af after I stop. I'd just like to orient us by using this slide, which was cribbed off the internet. I'm not actually sure who is originally responsible, but it's like, what is F-sharp you know, aiming for in the sort of sweet spot of programming? And it's coming from this perspective that the, the sweet spot of programming is functions and data. That's a place where people end up really, really productive with really simple code. And then you add just enough of everything else to support that core mission of supporting functions and data. So this graph is one of those, one of those things that goes, goes around Twitter and the like, where you have like code complexity on the left and you have the, the programmer beginning with their super simple code. And then, then they learn all about object-oriented programming and design patterns and abstractions and interfaces. And, and then they kind of learn to throw it all away. Oh, they're probably, you know, it's not like they're learning nothing, but you know what I mean? People go over the top in the use of object-oriented programming. And they come back to functions and data as being the sweet spot. And then they then the same thing can apply to things more associated with the functional programming space. They can learn all about purity. They can learn uh, a number of different design patterns, applicatives, and other things. 
we can get deep into category theory and effects. And then, uh, well, depends on exactly on the situation. They may stay there. They may continue on and come back to functions and data. Now, it's not just functions and data. We want functions and data with just enough typing, just enough object programming, just enough of these kind of abstractions or composition, compositional uh, abstractions in the, uh, in the areas of monads or whatever we decide to call them. But the core mission is around functions and data and keeping you in that sweet spot. And, and that's the simple place to be. So where did it originate from? I loved OCaml in 2002. And I, you know, I had this sort of obsession to ensure that the point of view on programming represented by strongly typed functional programming was a viable option right through the 21st century. And, uh, and in the context of the .NET ecosystem is where we started. F Sharp is now also a JavaScript language, has a great JavaScript compiler. Uh, there are lots of other people who have also thrown themselves at this problem. And I refer you to my talk on the early history of F Sharp uh, that was at the History of Programming Languages conference uh, from this year. And I cover quite a lot of the background for where we're coming from. And then that can help you orient yourself uh, in the decisions that have been made. So the F Sharp approach, we start with Coro Camel. We, we do want the sort of core product productivity space spot of, of functions and data in the strongly typed uh, functional programming kind of way. Uh, uh, we have a big focus on interoperability. We decide that an F sharp, F -sharp is a JavaScript language. F -sharp is a .NET language. And so we, are re we perfectly, we're not gonna do our own virtual machine. Uh, nor are we going to try to create a whole ecosystem. It's much more we, we land with an exosystem around us, hence the, the need to interoperate a lot. Uh, there's a lot of em emphasis on, you know, we only want just enough of the object-oriented thing. In fact, when we talk about it in F-Sharp, we talk about just taking object programming. We don't take object orientation. We just take object programming. So we drop the orientation. So that, that involved a lot of deconstruction to kind of find how much of that we wanted to take into F-Sharp. Uh, also to some extent on functional programming and sort of finding a synthesis wherever possible. And you can read the rest there, uh, sort of how we've delivered it over the years. And it's going great today. We're going to announce F Sharp 6.0 in a blog post today. So you can check out what, uh, look, look on uh, Twitter and uh, the interwebs later to check out what we've been releasing. Okay, so what does that mean? We start with expression oriented strongly type functional programming, and we add various things. And I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, just, it's just orienting. And there's sort of different dimensions that kind of programming language design takes you and from that sort of core starting point. So in the area of parameterization, for example, of course we have functional abstraction and parameterization, defining functions, uh, but we don't sort of do the, the standard ML thing of adding functors. So we don't do that, so I'll put that in gray. So uh, what do we do in the area of sort of type definitions? Well, we start with the core, immutable by default, algebraic data, that's fine. We're gonna be happy to add functional objects and nominal objects, classes and interfaces, some, sometimes to interrupt, but also sometimes because they're generally great. Uh, but we don't particularly go down the structural objects kind of route, just explaining what we do and what we don't do. On the soundless kind of questions, you know, there's some, uh, that's a sort of dimension you can explore. We do care a lot about initialization soundness and not exposing programmers. You know, the word let is trustworthy in F -sharp. You can, if uh, <laughs> that initialization will have been executed. And, and we, it's not that there are no nulls in F -sharp programming. You can get them in various ways, but we, we care a lot about initialization soundness. We, we don't go down the agenda that soundness is supreme. There are backdoors in F sharp. There is array dot zero create to create uninitialized arrays with uh, and zero initialized data, that sort of thing. So we certainly don't go down the route of formal specification so we can cut those off. In types and type inference, we do types for modeling, perf, correctness, interoperability. Uh, those are all crucial themes. We, we do embrace Hindley Milner, which makes it quite different to pretty much every other practical strongly typed language in the kind of using an industrial virtual machine kind of space. It's, it's similar to Elm maybe, and, and well, Camel has its own runtime, but if you look at the .NET and Java languages, 
uh, they generally don't use allow him, him in Milner, but in F sharp, when you, you can program with happily in the kind of OCaml Henry Milner kind of way for, and end up with very nice succinct code. Uh, we also modify Henry Milner to allow object programming. We also add this fast generic in my math, and, but we don't do type classes and type level computation uh beyond um what's necessary for fast generic uh arithmetic and some some constraints i'll talk more about that later we certainly don't do types for logic and proof then there's this direction of computational modalities which has seen quite a lot of work in the 2000s uh so we have a great very powerful list comprehensions uh we also have a very powerful mnemonic notation throughout which is called, which is called computation expressions and that together gives this um, this really this is how we do asynchronous programming. This is how we do asynchronous sequences. We do task programming and uh, queries and applicatives and a whole bunch of things. So it's actually really and it fits very well with this expression oriented programming paradigm. And over on the interrupt, uh, we have this basic decision that F sharp types are .NET types and .NET types are F sharp types. When you're working in the .NET world, there's a JavaScript story like that as well. And then we do this thing called type providers, which I'll be talking about. That's to orient you about what F is and isn't and what we do on different dimensions. Okay, so let's talk about static and dynamic and where we land on that. So traditionally, the world you know, we came from, you know, Camel, it's a very, very static point of view. That is, uh, there, there, there is no dynamic typing. Types don't even host any code. You know, function types, which which were implemented somewhere else, but but types don't host any code. Types have no computational content. You can erase all the inferred types, and the execution stays the same. There's no reflection, little or no metaprogramming. So that's the world we came from. Okay, so uh, we took that world, which I've put down the left, and we extended it in various ways that are consistent with that world: nominal object programming, comprehensions, the things I've mentioned, modules, whatever units of measure interrupt. Okay, so that's all fine. That's the statically typed, typed world uh, that is great to very, very productive to programming. And then we also broke the rules in a whole lot of ways uh, to actually mean that F-Shop is actually quite a dynamic language. So I just list them off and I'll give examples of them in a moment. Most of these aren't particularly remarkable by uh, standards of any other languages, but from the if I from the point of view of the say the ML workshop for the uh, for that class of programming languages, I would probably have to justify each of these the fairly lengthy discussion about why we did this and and why you know why it was valid to bring that into into a, uh, the kind of language that F sharp is and, and and what are we losing when we do that? Okay. So um, runtime types, runtime reflection on some things, on, um, including on code, and I'll give some examples. And then there's some compile time things, which are type providers. Uh, we also allow F sharp, uh, we uh, have a thing called the F sharp compiler service, which means you can just transpile F sharp to JavaScript and create a thing called Fable or Web Sharper, which is the uh, two JavaScript compilers for F sharp. And then uh, you, and you can also use that to do compile time analysis. Okay, uh, and there's one other construct at the end, which is this dynamic construct expression question mark name, which I'm not really gonna talk about today because no one ever really uses it in F sharp. Uh, so just to go through some examples of that, you can do dot get type to get a system dot type for a rarefied type object for anything in F sharp. Now that's unusual in a in a in an ML family language, but it's no problem. You can do it. You can find out that thing is actually a, a, a tuple of integers. You can also do the runtime type tests with the colon question mark. You can also do them with the pattern matching, which is below. And, and this is all becoming quite standard in things like C sharp and Kotlin, and uh, and other such languages. You can do runtime reflection on nominal types. So you can do type of X and start to poke around inside its rarefied type. Uh, you can do runtime reflection on F-sharp algebraic types. You can get the union cases of a union type. So the F-sharp core library uh, does sort of let you decompile or into a reflective view on union types and record types and other, uh, other such things. A few things we completely get rid of, things like units of measure, uh, but in theory, we could, it would be consistent with the language design to just add in or add in those kind of dynamic features as we go along. 
again, the, it's a little bit off, but just to give you a taste of it a bit more, this does work in generic code. So you can do type of T. Uh, so the, everywhere, because of the nice nature of .NET generics, the T's just flow through the generic code and are always available everywhere without hassle. Uh, no, so that that's a, just a pervasive availability of rarefied types is very nice, and it's. Uh, you can also do quotations you, uh, on expressions. You can do uh, runtime, so runtime reflection on expressions. You can do runtime reflection on definitions, which gives you a quotation back, which kind of you can find out that the, the function f here actually has an implementation x plus one, and you can go around poke inside, poke inside that and interpret that uh, those trees. Nothing too surprising there. And these things get packaged together in uh, to allow actually very implicit syntax, which is you can do query call and, and you can define your own uh, similar comprehensions which have their own um, which which activate the quotations mechanism to get what's inside the query and then do runtime translation of, of, of queries okay so it, uh, some of this is very much in the space that C sharp is doing with link and, and we use the same implementations and libraries underneath for some of these things or we translate across to them but just to and so all of these things are unusual in the, the, the family of languages where f sharp is coming from but all of them work totally fine uh, they change the nature of the language a little bit the guarantees we give about the language uh, but they are you know they're actually quite a sensible package of you know of, of investments in uh, of, of additions so in this world on the static dynamic access it's a big thing we've got 80 percent or more of that we want nearly all the coding to be statically typed and tight f sharp comes across in its usage it's a very tight language okay in the sense that you very rarely break the rules and only use it in fairly localized kind of ways you won't see a lot of type tests in in f sharp code if i search through the f sharp compiler there would only probably be, you know and goodness knows so many lines of code probably only be like 100 200 type tests i'm not i'm, I'm not sure it depends i have to look at it but it's not that many okay so most of it drops out through the statically typed uh functional uh, programming kind of paradigm or the core ml kind of paradigm but you certainly can break the rules in lots and lots of ways uh, which give you runtime uh, which give you um, sort of more dynamic feel to the language. Okay, now one particular mechanism I want to talk about is the sharp type providers, which I, uh, which break the rules in a very different kind of way, and it's still all, an almost unique thing. They, they, C sharp is getting very close to F sharp type providers, or a, a sort of a different take through a thing called source generators. Uh, and uh, they are a powerful addition into the C sharp compilation. Uh, chain and uh, into the tooling into the, in many ways into the language they've got a slightly different emphasis in type providers so i'm going to talk about type providers but a lot of what i talk about can also apply to c sharp source generators or to future things uh future variations or additions extensions they're going to make to c sharp type providers c sharp um, source generators uh some of what i apply also can apply to scala macros uh and uh and much of this work is like about six uh six done about six to seven years ago and i'm sure there's been other kind of related work which not all of which i will have uh kept up on okay so why did why do we do this thing called type writers? what are we aiming for okay so uh and the aim is that it's about this thing about the languages having an exosystem, languages needing to interoperate, languages needing to interoperate with information spaces that are coming from the outside. And I want to talk about the philosophy a little bit. So the idea was you know, modern programming is information rich. And here's the sort of slides we used 10 years ago to kind of show this sort of massive ex exponential explosion in open APIs. Uh, and that this hasn't stopped, of course, it's just it's becoming totally standard that everything has APIs we can access. Uh, and it's not just web APIs, this applies to database information working, it applies to actually so many different kinds of programming. But the languages, especially the point of view on languages where the F sharp was coming from, the kind of ML family of languages, uh, if you look in the standard definition of ML and you ask what is the initial basis for, for the world, for, you know, it lists off like five functions. 
uh, the, the, the initial library basis. There's nothing there, right? It starts from nothing, okay? Uh, and uh, in, in its sort of environment of what is accessible in the type checking environment. And that's fine. So we add libraries into that. But in the end, in some sense, our languages are information sparse. Uh, they're, and they're information sparse almost by construction that they're born into an information sparse point of view and then we have to program we have to kind of library up everything around it but we can't automate the constructions of those libraries and this is particularly a problem for strongly typed languages because you know we can't access anything without giving it sort of types so uh, and yet we we have this incredibly information rich world around us but that we can't automate the synthesis or access to that world to any we to the degree that we want to be able to do. We just have to go and code up the world library by library. And so we want, instead we want to take a different approach about like bring all the information in uh, at internet scale, strongly tooled and strongly typed. That's the kind of philosophy we were kind of running with. And I think it's a radical point of view. I'd like to see other people take this point of view and kind of run with it in their own way. Okay, because it might lead to a different technical outcome, but the problem remains the same, that the, the world is absolutely information rich, strongly typed languages have a problem in accessing that world. And it's exactly in this kind of programming that a lot of people reach for dynamic type, typing, right? Uh, uh, because if you, uh, if you look at Python, or uh, one of the great things it does is kind of flood you with information, I would flood you with ways, you know, there are libraries out there that will automatically give you Python objects, which, um, which facade are uh, very large information spaces. And, um, and, and can do that sort of be created automatically in order to give you access to the information in your programming context. So, uh, so there is this thing uh, statically and uh, that dynamically typed languages have have kind of merged. And this this the usual game is to sort of do what I first described: make your statically typed languages more dynamic, or make your dynamically typed languages more static. And we see both of those going on at full bore. But type providers give a different point of view, which is we're going to say we're actually going to moderate what our static typing is. But we're going to automate the production of, of, of the typing environment. Uh, and uh, that, that's kind of a different take. And there may be other variations which we could add to that list. And I want you to have a think about those. So I'm going to give one example of using a type provider. So I'm actually going to do a little bit of scripting. So I've got the thing called the F-sharp data library here. And if I, if I look inside the F-sharp data library, Hope everyone can see my screen. I am still screen sharing, that's good. And we can see there's a thing called the HTML provider. And you can use the HTML provider to basically say, give me some data. Let's take a look here. So let's say, give me the, um, give me say the list of packages or give me some web page and I want to screen scrape this web page you know I, I might want to say just start screen, screen scraping this one or I might want to start filtering and then I want to bring this data the actual data that's on the page into my programming experience okay and so you give the uh, the, the address of the data you want to access and you start uh, programming away Got this right uh, that's it. Um, just check that this is right. Uh, oh. uh, right. Okay, but we let's do a different data source because this one is not so interesting. It's a bit introverted. I'm going to go even more introverted for the people who are the old timers here at Rebase. And I'm actually gonna go and look at some data about Oopsla, okay. And I wanna grab this data and I'm particularly interested in this table here. And I hope that we have some of the good people who have been chairing Oopsla all the years it was running. And it eventually became part of Splash and Rebase is part of Splash. And so uh, there's a long and glorious history to Oopsla going back to 1986. 
And so let's say we wanted to grab this table of data. Well, we can just kind of point that. And, and what I'd like you to think about, what is the type of this web page? Okay, how do we give this web page a type? What's our tooling that we should use to take data, which has obvious structure, in some sense there's an obvious kind of synthesis of types that we can give this web page. And, uh, and, and then also think about applying that to giving people an arbitrary JSON data, giving people, taking arbitrary XML data, taking arbitrary CSV data, and giving that data a type that a programmer can meaningfully use. So what sort of assumptions are we making about information, about how that information is going to be used, about what kind of types are going to be most useful in, in, in grabbing that information? How do we interoperate? with this web page as if it was a library okay now that's a really different and somewhat unusual point of view okay so uh once you have let's say you have your oopsla so we'll say oopsla oopsla equals this then you can go to oopsla and we can get ourselves a sample of the data it's here and we can poke around inside the data. Oh, it's got, it's worked something out about this. It's worked out that it's got tables. It's worked out it's got HTML. Let's see what tables it's got. Well, it's got, a, it's got table four. This is the one we want. I don't know why the edit is at the end. That, that, that looks a little, that was probably because of this edit thing here in the header line, but it'll do. We'll, we'll get the data, we'll get the table and we'll, we'll look at the locations and organizers. And then we'll say, well, what's in that? Well, it's got some rows. Let's take a look. And it's gone and given it some type. It's given it a specific type, which is specifically sort of fluffed up, generated, uh, provided, which is called the locations of, uh, and edit dot row or whatever that is. I don't really care about that. So we'll go for row in this thing and we're going to do something and we can poke around inside the rows. We can see what's there. Oh, there's a conference chair. Hmm. Okay, well, there's a, so it, it really has synthesized some useful types from this data. We are using this uh, web page as if it was a library. It's nice and good. And we can put that all in a list comprehension and we can uh, execute some code. Here we've got our data. And there we have it. We've got our data about all the good people uh, over the years, including Jan, uh, uh, here from 2018, who uh, have organized Oopsla. And thank you for doing that. Uh, okay, so that's just a demo of how, of the philosophy of type providers and how uh, this thing, whatever it's doing, is an automated production of libraries or types from the arguments that it's given. And that these arguments can be all sorts of things. In this case, we're doing screen scraping. You can also give a schema file or a database connection. And in fact, I can give some more examples of that. So just to say, how do you write these things? Well, it's a bit of reflective programming. Uh, so this is what a, a basic type provider looks like. It's actually an object in F sharp. You inherit from some basic implementation and then you start creating these pro provided type definitions in a certain namespace, in a certain, uh, <coughs> with a certain name uh, and you provide methods and the methods have implementations and this is all running the sub the definition at the top is a component that plugs into the f-sharp compiler and runs at compile time okay so this code is running so as you work with this type type provider so actually in your code you're typing away like i was doing you start typing my type it will go and ask the type provider, well, what methods do you have? Okay, you know, I have a method called my method. Yeah, well, what types are you providing? And you, you can provide like millions of types and you can provide them in hierarchies. So you can actually provide an unbounded number of types. Okay, they're all nom nominal. You're still providing nominal. It's, it's a lot like a macro system, except it's kind of implemented in these libraries which uses reflective programming. Uh, so it's, it's definitely the similarities with Scala macros and there's interplay between the two. Uh, but the end experience is you just get a whole lot of types delivered and those types play a role in mediating your access to some kind of resources. And that's how, okay. So it's a different kind of metaprogramming. It's on the lazy on-demand generation of nominal object type definitions by compiler plugins. And those compiler plugins are activated during the type checking process. 
it's not very generic. There are very few, very limited parameters. There are only static parameters, okay? You can't compute with the parameters uh, and uh, in, on the usage side. And there's, uh, you, they don't really provide, they do very sophisticated type level computation in our type level generation. And future iterations might allow more type level computation as well. But they're, they're, um, they don't really feel like that from the user's point of view. So they're reflective plugins and they're not quite macros. So you can think of them as macros uh, and nor are, they, nor are they using constrained type level um, programming in the sort of type classes or constraints kind of sense. It's a different kind of meta program. Okay. Right, so just some uh, examples of how they get used, uh, just to orient. So we have SQL connections uh, here. You can also just give um, use type providers to actually check your SQL queries, for example, to check that they're well formed uh, or potentially, so you're still using query SQL syntax, but checking that, you can check regular expressions at compile time. You can uh, so check well formedness of, of stringy strings strings uh, effectively in your language. Uh, you can get CSV data pointed at some CSV data and start to use that. Uh, you can use JSON data pointed at an open web API. Any one of the open APIs that give um, JSON data, you could just point the F sharp type provider at those things and and give it a sample. Uh, of, often things are documented using samples of data you just give it a sample of the data it works out some types according to whatever algorithm the json that the type provider is use, using uh xml uh you can also sort of interact with these sort of schematized big data systems we did these demonstrators of hadoop pipe and people uh, hadoop and hive and people do so with cloud-based data sources uh, as you kind of expect uh, and the old old fashioned web services and web APIs. And, and one interesting area was entity graphs, which uh, this thing called Freebase, it's no longer available, but it's just an old slide, but you can do this with other entity graphs. And these are very large um, systems with a, usually with some kind of preferred schema. And uh, you, you don't have to code generate the entire entity graph kind of surface area, but you can encode it, you can provide the types on demand, just a subset of the types that are actually being used. And you can also use this, and this is important, for interoperating with programming languages. And you can use it to interoperate, very relevant to this talk, is that you can use it to interoperate with dynamically typed languages. So these systems like R, Everybody thinks R as a dynamically typed language doesn't come with any useful types, but that's not true. It comes with a lot of useful metadata. And it comes, you can use, it comes with reflection APIs to query what functions are available in an R module and what R packages are available and what R modules are available and so on. And you can use all of that to build a type provider to help you as you're working in F sharp to help you actually call R as if it was strongly typed or partially or, or partially strongly typed. Python comes with the same sort of things. Now, no one's written a, a good Python type provider for F-sharp uh, as yet, but we, uh, we should do it. And as more typing information becomes available, for instance, through the typed Python kind of initiative uh, or through TypeScript for JavaScript, then you can, in theory, sometimes there are technical challenges in doing this. In theory, you can uh, use type providers to say, hey, we're going to interoperate with this dynamically typed world, but they're busy producing type information for us. So our language can benefit from that. Okay. And so this automating the production of a typed view of the world can be applied to things we normally think of as untyped. So there's another another couple of interesting themes that come out. Uh, firstly, is uh, what kind of what type does data have anyway? And so one thing is this, this lensing that goes on data at multiple scales. And when you're working with these uh, entity graphs, you can kind of look at the entities just as entities, data dot all entities, or you can or you can look at them with the kind of preferred schema, data dot automotive dot automobile models, and the thing kind of gives you a, a, a number of cars. But you can also sort of do this individual object typing, like what is the type of a Porsche 911? 
okay? And it is, uh, and in that, if you ask for the properties on, that are available on a Porsche 911, you can arrange it that it'll only give the properties that are actually populated for that particular automobile model. So you so there are examples of this where you do data dot science and technology dot computer scientist dot Simon Payton Jones dot birth date, and it it knows it's got the birth date that information system. So you kind of get this you know is he what is Simon Payton Jones? Is he a person? Is he a computer scientist? Is he an entity? Is he Simon Payton Jones? Is all of those things depending on the kind of lensing or the kind of the scale or the kind of depending what what kind of programming you're going to do. Uh, with uh, at the different kind of um, at the different kind of lenses uh, you're going to look at that data with, and so it's quite fun. And you can the fact that type providers can provide an unbounded number of nominal types leads to lots of interesting kind of um, kind of applications of these of these things. Okay, down to the point that every entity gets a unique type. It's a bit like asking what is the type of the number one? Is it an integer or is it the number one? You know, is it that specific thing or is it just a number? Okay, you can look at it at quite fine granularity uh, kind of levels. Okay, there's another thing that comes in is that, you know, suddenly these type systems are now interacting with these information spaces or metadata. And there's a lot of things that those things can come with, like units of measure or security information or documentation or provenance or privacy, ratings, rankings, search. And so you start to think, well, wouldn't it be nice if I could, as I was typing, I could actually search those, these entity spaces or search the database and, and get kind of sort of, these things can all, all have these units of measure flow in. And so one example of that is uh, a database here, which is providing units of measure in its preferred schema. And so in F sharp, we map those across into the programming language. Uh, here you can see, you know, the top wind from a cyclone is getting annotated with the idea that it's meters per second. And so, the, you, and, that, and that, that gives a different perspective on the importance of things like units of measure in a programming language. If they're going to start flooding in from the outside, then maybe we should support them and uh, can apply to other things as well. Okay. So one thing that uh, another theme in type providers is schema change. Uh, so it's a it's a big hard problem. Okay, so the data sources you're connecting to, like Wikipedia, I showed you before, can be a lot of them are surprisingly stable, or you can snapshot them. There are ways to say I want to pinpoint that Oopsla page so I see it as it was at a particular date, and then it becomes a reliable source of information and types that can be projected into the programming language. Data scripting is generally not so exposed to schema change. Uh, some systems help, do support invalidation signals to tell you if the scheme has changed at while you're coding. Uh, and you can make code less fragile by actually using erasure all the way through, which is what most type providers do. But just but let, let's think about schema change and you know, what we're doing here. And we're saying, well, do types, if types represent abstractions of reality, then types, reality evolves, okay? Types evolve and they have a temporal life. And I feel that our languages completely fail to capture the temporal life of types. Okay, now we, there's, there are good attempts to do this as things like variational type checking. To me, I think an, an underexplored research topic is kind of temporal type systems where you can start to use temporal logics to kind of pin down what is the future, as we write a piece of code, what's the future evolution we're expecting for the things we're interoperating with. And uh, so we might, for instance, say, hey, it's okay if that Wikipedia page gets extra tables, but it's not okay if the tables just disappear. And can you kind of capture that in, in kind of what you're predicting about the, the future of, of types and information sources? It's not in the F sharp design and it's purely speculative, but I thought I'd mention it to, uh, as a point of interest. Okay, the, the final theme is a little bit uh, more, you know, esoteric, and that is about type systems and reality. Uh, we we like to see programming language systems as as logical systems. Okay, traditional logical systems have basically excluded reality. It's got what I um, 
you know, they start with nothing uh, as if they're like a philosophy or a core logic. And the most extreme version of this is things like LCF theorem proving, where there's really five axioms, five inference rules, and you code up all of mathematics based on that, that starting point by introducing various definitions. But this is an obviously wrong approach for modern applied languages. There is, we interact with reality all the time. Okay, and this, and this separation goes right back to all the traditions we have in our kind of work of PL, right back to Bertrand Russell, Alonzo Church, and probably way back before that as well. And one way to look at it is in the typical typing judgment in a programming language. And people do lots of work on programs, lots of work on expressions, and they do lots of work on typing. But the gammas are usually kind of simple. Why is it's just kind of a static? And there's this one particular assumption which is built into everything, which is that the initial environment is kind of empty. And also that the another way of looking at this is that the gamma has very little computational content. Okay, it's just a list of libraries or types that are available, but it can't really compute itself into existence. So this is, you can look at that, that as being the kind of exclusion of reality, okay? And let's just meditate on that, on what gamma naught is actually like. What is the actual environment we have to, uh, the reality we, um, what is it? It's the ever-growing ocean of digital reality around us. It isn't what you are. You're writing in a language, but the gamma probably doesn't speak your language. It probably speaks other languages of uh, other schemas and other kind of preferred points of view on what is a string or an integer. And, and so we got to interoperate with that. In theory, it's mutually recursive with you. You're actually part of this thing, but we'll just put that aside for the moment. That, uh, that can become important in some, uh, some applications where you have tooling that is programming tooling that's tightly into, integrated with say a designer tool but we'll just put that aside. It is being organized. And this is a crucial point, you know, Google's mission is to organize the world's information. A whole lot of other people's mission is like that as well. People are writing schemas for entity graphs and, and, and open APIs and the world of information is being organized and we, and we have to be able to benefit and leverage that organization. It's got Interesting properties, it's got security properties, for example. Sometimes you need uh, keys to access some parts of, of the environment. And one really weird thing is sometimes the things we might think of as types are actually kind of uncertain or full of probabilities, which is uh, you know, that uh, an entity, a, an actor is probably a human, but not always, an actor might be a dog, for example. And so, so there are there are parts of these informations of gamma naught which are uncertain and prob probabilistic. Uh, right, there's lots and lots of related work for people accessing into the magical world of gamma naught, and uh, I've just listed some of them here, but there's zillions of others, and obviously many many ad hoc techniques for using template programming or using uh, source generation and different kind of tooling to kind of uh, to do this kind of work. So one of the things that came up is about constraint-based type level programming, because people do do some of these kind of things in this using uh, type level programming. You think of type classes on steroids, okay, where you put more and more computational content into the type system. So people, for instance, implement JSON parsers inside the uh, inside C++ templates. They implement XML parsers or and the like. And so they start to head to the world that F# -sharp type providers is dealing with by using this constraint-based type level programming. F# -sharp does have some constraint-based type level programming, static parametric overloading via member constraints. It's used mainly for arithmetic and uh, some kind of duct typing. But I, I recently put out a post saying why we don't want to do that much more of this in F-sharp. And I listed out a bunch of problems that this has. Uh, I'll go through them. Uh, now, these are assertions. They're not meant to be criticisms, but they're meant to be like a, um, a balanced point of view on type-level programming, constraint-based type-level programming. So type classes are, tend to be a slippery slope. You have, want to put more and more computational content into your type-level. You see that with C++ templates. Type classes can uh, just add a classification hierarchy, which uh, I, I tend to have a bit of a um, problem with classification hierarchies. Uh, we and, and de-emphasize them in F-sharp programming. 
there's a whole problem with compile time computation uh, in that it's certainly, you have to have better tooling, debugging, profiling, and tracing. Uh, you have to be able to debug your C++ templates or profile them uh, into, because they can soak up a lot of performance. And using this kind of mechanism tends to need an end-to-end -end API design. And perhaps the most problematic thing for me is, especially if it's strongly associated with category theory, these, these techniques can mean the most empowered person in a team or in the room is the category theorist. And I don't want F-sharp to be that kind of language. I want F-sharp to be a language which empowers all programmers. Okay, so there's a contentious position. I, say I don't really mean it as a criticism. I actually love, conceptually, I love type level programming, but it's an observation about the sort of delivery of languages in practice. And uh, I know there's, you know, this is, it's so important to teach our students about type level programming as a thing, give them a whole, because uh, they're going to be encountering it their whole life, for sure. In C++ templates are going to uh, encounter it. I'm sure Russ has its mechanisms uh, in Scala, in Haskell or whatever. So it's crucial to students know about this topic. It's true that a certain set of expectations have developed about what's normal. People want this kind of type, certain kinds of type level programming and categorization. And they, they want, they, they, they get quite frustrated when that isn't available to them. So it becomes part of the very core of how they see programming. There are a lot, there are important uses without a doubt, verifiability and proof, ultra high perf. Uh, uh, and, and what's interesting is that you start to see the stuff being used more and more for code interop to express the design patterns that are present in Python and TypeScript libraries. Uh, so TypeScript is a really good example of this. It has this more and more powerful type level programming. It's Turing complete at the type level, as far as I understand it, um, and it's serving a crucial role for interop. So, but for F sharp, and C sharp, we have this sort of reflective generative type level programming through source generators and, and type providers. And it gives a different kind of answers. Okay, so just to conclude, F sharp stems from the static purist tradition. We broke lots of rules and added 80 20 mechanisms to strongly moderate this. Type providers and source generators give powerful, practical, reflective type level programming, and it helps with static to dynamic, static to schema, static to data. And they are an important factor of why we limit the role of constraint-based type level programming. And thank you very much for that. And let's have our discussion. Yeah, thanks, Don. All right, so what I propose is we start by uh, letting Nico comment and tell us what sort of comes to his mind for a few minutes after hearing Don. And then we'll, we can uh, field questions, which you can put in the chat and or, or, or you know, raise your hand on Zoom. Um, is that great, Nico? Well, that was a great, that was a really great talk, Don. Thank you. And timely in some sense, because I've been thinking a lot about, like I, for me personally, timely, because I've been thinking a lot about kind of related topics of how to make, how to open up Rust or just programming, I guess, so that it's more extensible, right? Like I think of Rust, when Rust is really delivering value to people, it's because it's empowering them to do things they didn't think they could do or they didn't have the right tools to do, uh, that didn't make sense to do with the tools they had, like building system level programming, you know, was too much work and maintenance and so on. So they had to, to use higher different mechanisms. Uh, and I've been thinking lightly about like, well, can we empower even more, right? Can we make it recursive so that you already see this happening, like DSLs and so forth crop up, or you have like Rust libraries that like map to SQL and let you do queries, like Diesel as an example, and they'll do static type checking of your queries, but then you get these horrible errors, right? Where like, okay, the type system, you know, it's actually that you put a Boolean where a number was intended, but the error you get is like, I couldn't match this crazy template to that other thing uh, because uh -huh. you know my SQL instance is not implemented by this thing. And so uh, some of the direction I was thinking was more along this line of, well, how, what if we gave library authors a lot more control over the developer experience? What if we let them customize the logic for how an error is reported? Um, or if you're in an IDE setting, like suggest refactorings, or maybe they can add uh -huh. lints into the compiler. 
Um, so this type of provider is, is totally in, in line with that and really cool. Um, I, I did have a few questions, but I'm going to let you run with that if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> I, I should absolutely have mentioned error messages from type level programming as being one of the major concerns about that. The amount of effort I know, I know Russ does a lot in this. I know Elm does a lot. People send me examples of Russ and Elm error messages and they say they're so great. And, uh, and so they say F-sharp should be like this. And we, you know, engineering er good error messages is just a really big part of the work we have to do. And it's gonna be true for anybody providing type level programming or you know, the kind of example you, you gave. And, and yeah, I mean, I just can't imagine coding that up in the kind of constraint-based systems that people kind of um, talk about. I, I think um, you just have to program them in the normal level in a way. So you have to go for this reflective kind of approaches really. Um, but yeah, okay, cool. Glad it's timely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess I was wondering about some of the limits or that you might encounter. Like you mentioned how like one simple question you mentioned how a Porsche, you have a specific type for a Porsche 911, and you can also view it as a category of cars or something. What if I, can you convert between those types, for example, if I want to look, if I'm looking at a particular entity and I want to call some generic code that works on any entity? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, so we, 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 F-Shop does have subtyping, and so in, 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 the, in the nominal hierarchy interface so you can do uh, uh, multiple inheritance interface um, uh, type typing and so you, you we give the we give that the type provider author can provide a inheritance hierarchy of types but it absolutely comes up that that's not necessarily sufficient to characterize the relationships between types that we actually get in practice i mean i guess the one i talked about most was a temporal relationship between types between version one of an api and version two of an api uh the compat sort of compatibility relationships uh but there are also subtyping relationships um that are very common one is where properties may be present, optionally present in, in at one level and then become definitely or def definitely present or definitely not present in subtypes of those things. So there's kind of refinements of those things. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Our, I mean, there's this, there's this kind of catch 22. On the one hand, this kind of this work makes you want to beef up uh, your type system so you can express provenance. So it can express like uh, you want to take every bit of research that's ever been done at a popple conference uh, and suddenly kind of put it into your language to allow you to kind of interoperate with these kind of spaces. Uh, but then on the other hand, you don't want to do that because you kind of explode up your, your complexity of your type, your type system and the tracking that you do. Uh, so and, and so that applies to the relationships between types. It's very common that you just end up providing a massive uh, number of um, types that are not in a subtyping uh, an implicit kind of coercion kind of relationship. You have to ex explicitly coerce between all those things. Well, okay. One, one thing I thought of when you were talking is there's a classic critique from that I, I've usually read in the context of game programming, but of object oriented, which basically says, every category is wrong. And, and I think it's related to your sort of probabilistic, your, your contention of, you know, an actor is usually a human, but not always. Yeah. You'd be very tempted to make actor a subtype of human until you realize that it was wrong. And so this is more leads you down this kind of entity path where things are, you have entities and they can, you can just kind of add properties and methods to them in an ad hoc basis. Because, yeah, so certainly uh, in those systems when those schemas are not, are not 100% reliable, yeah, so the schema for a, an actor will probably be assuming that it's a human and then you'll get like, yeah. So it's important to be able, now, of course, you're not always in, in trouble with entity graphs. Sometimes you've got much tighter schemas with databases. Uh, it, it, it is interesting to me how much the um, people use samples in order to document things possibilities these days uh, and so we can use um, sort of inference it, 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 it 
it, it gives a point to inject these kind of inference processes to infer reasonable types from data. And our paper from 2016 on, on the f-sharp.data library is about one stab at that. But I think I'd love to see students let loose, uh, not necessarily in f-sharp, into some, they can do their own, own whole language or whatever, but with the, with the idea that we're going to take the notion of inferring types from data more more seriously and people can also use machine learning to do that there's no reason not to have given uh, enough enough sample points uh so yeah we should be taking that part of the game more seriously or to at least letting some students loose on that my last random thought <laughs> to connection between things i've been thinking about is you mentioned language interop and i was glad you did because that seems like a really powerful application of this and and one of the as as a place where we've struggled, like with, with Rust, for example, is you'd like to interoperate with C++. C++ offers a lot of templates. There's the set of instantiations of those templates that you're going to need depends on the Rust program. So you can't really pre-process it, right? Where you can have people list them out in a file or something, but it's extremely tedious. What you really want to do is, is have the Rust compiler basically request, oh, I need you to give me a type that represents like vector instantiated for for boolean or whatever uh -huh. and um and then have the back end generate the code or do whatever it has to do and maybe that involves some shimming because like probably the rust compiler doesn't want to learn all the particularities of the c plus plus abi yeah. so you would like a c wrapper yeah and th um, can you do that kind of thing can you generate code that lets you interoperate well, C++, you've listed one, one of the most brutal uh, interrupt problems in the industry today, probably. Uh, it's like interoperating. I used to joke in the days of .NET generics, I used to joke that C++ couldn't even interoperate with itself, right? Because different C++ compilers uh, weren't, there was no compatibility standard back then. And in the idealistic early days of .NET, when people were pushing it as kind of a multi-language runtime, including for C++, uh, there was kind of the idea that generics maybe could sort of eventually be a kind of um, sort of universal substrate. And, and F-sharp and C-sharp do do the kind of generic instantiation kind of stuff that you do. But that's not really... So, but on the type promoter side of that, yeah, what the specific problem of interoperating C++ templates is really, really hard. I mean, I think in theory, you could, for instance, have a C++ type provider in F sharp, which literally put in a piece of C++ code and in the string as the argument, and it compiled that C++ code. And if it's got a binary, there are now binary API standards for C++, it then dynamically, it then makes sure that that component is available for pro static programming at compile time and, and then actually available at runtime as well. You could have a Fortran type provider where you whacked in a bit of Fortran code and, and it literally called a Fortran compiler during compilation and made that available. So in, in, in theory, you can do any, any, anything like that. Is that a, a lot of the problems with type providers are about like making actually delivering these things into the compile time tool chains because you want them to work uh, at compile time. You want them to work in the IDE as well. So it'd be activated and used in the IDE. There's a perfectly strong argument to say that actually the compiler is the wrong place to host this, that our build system should be ho hosting this kind of tool. And there are places like T4 templates in .NET world, which are very popular with C Sharp, which, can do it, which you can kind of arrange to do quite a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, so there are valid arguments to have about where we host the this kind of functionality in our in our build and build in our build pipelines and tool chains and and the on the interrupt thing the it, one tricky thing we're having is that if you take JavaScript so the TypeScript is serving as the typed world for JavaScript. So we want to interoperate with these TypeScript files, but the system of generics, the type level programming that those APIs are getting expressed with. So people go and hand write or generate or whatever these TypeScript files, and we've got to interpret them into the F-sharp type system, but we can't. There are whole, there are whole patterns in there in type, that TypeScript manages to capture in its type system, which we can't interpret into F-sharp. And so the, the F-sharp to JavaScript compilers don't actually use type providers for this, they use code generation because we can't cope with it because the F-sharp type system is not, by design, yeah. is not rich enough to 
and it gets back to that thing that these type providing interrupt kind of things make you want to beef up your type system to be the kind of union of all possible type systems in the world and uh and that and that that just gets out of control uh we do use it for r and that is marginally successful uh we certainly people certainly use it for data and for sql it, yeah that, that, that's where things are at today so if i may interject uh one of one question that i wonder about is you know sort of the audience of these you know different level of static and static type system so you know i i worked a lot a lot with r and in in r statistician teach the language in an afternoon it's a two-hour session and then people are off doing their thing so you know that that you know give you you get di dynamic guarantees of correctness but it's you know the bar to entry is somewhat lower. So what's the... Uh, ab absolutely. Um, the I certainly wouldn't claim that the end result in F sharp is a lower barrier to entry in any of those systems. That's from a huge number of things. The first thing is just like examples, documentation, uh, are all uh, blog posts, everything you search on the web to find out how to use the technology is going to be in R and not in F sharp. And, and it's not like we're providing all that across as well. Um, the same with SQL or, or, or something. So this is much more about like enabling the F sharp programmer to actually have some option for using these systems. Um, yeah. I didn't interpret, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jan, but I didn't interpret the question as does this meant to be an entryway to R programming, but so much as like, is does this broaden the pool of F sharp programmers? Are there people who wouldn't have been interested in F sharp before because they didn't want to do that kind of programming, but now they're saying, ah, oh, this is easy for me to learn. I actually do want to scrape some stuff off Wikipedia. You know, uh, F sharp uh, is now way more accessible than uh, any other technology. Uh, 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 absolutely, that definitely works on the data side of things. Uh, we we have. Plenty of people just using F Sharp just for its API access capabilities or for um, its data access. Less so on the on the interoperating with dynamic languages. Uh, I mean, there are these things, but they're numerically not that widely used in the F Sharp world. So it'd be like a factor of 100 for accessing data, a factor of 10 for accessing schema and databases, and then a factor of one or, or less for accessing a dynamically system. I mean, that that's also partly to do with deployment. The big problem with things like R tend to be actually deploying in production within the constraints of some kind of organization may not allow R to be used in a production online system or something like that. And um, so, you know, and the role that F sharp German serves is to say, okay, prototype something in R and then translate it across to uh, F sharp and deploy with F sharp. What I was wondering was more, you know, if you take, you know, a dynamic language, F sharp, Rust, there seems to be uh, an increase in complexity of the type systems. And I, I was wondering what is the, you know, does that correlate with sort of a smaller pool of potential programmer or is there a way you know, or is there hope for us to teach, you know, these it, types of Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, typed programming uh, with, a, with a relatively small gamma naught, just a bunch of libraries, for example, is uh, incredibly productive, incredible, you know, uh, it's, it, it's just a wonderful place to be. But you could, you, I think this helps explain why dynamic languages are so successful in some information rich areas. Okay, if we in the typed world have to go to the, to the extent of putting in computational plugins into our compilers, just to even have a hope of playing in these spaces in a compelling way, okay, the, the, the end experience is really good, but it's a pretty brutal thing we've had to do. Uh, in order to be able to play in this space. I mean, at, at least play in a strongly typed way. Of course, you can access CSV or XML in a weakly typed way uh, by all sorts of various techniques. But um, no, I, I, you, you, one way of looking at this work is to say, boy, those static type people, typing people have a problem, right? 
and that problem is information coming from the outside and uh i you like it's so much more complex than the interpreters like a python interpreter uh i i think yeah because it uh is it more complex than but if i may i i can give you an example the problem is not complexity it's the just the sheer size so you get a table with 120 columns just writing a type expression by hand for that is just not practical uh Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Manually doing, so people just don't do it. People use these type programming languages and simply get an XML element and, or whatever, and it contains a weekly type view of that information. Uh, and that happens all, all the time. That, but I, I meant more like the experience of using Python or what have you to access an information rich setting is very good, right? It feels very light and easy. But I think the same is true when you're using type providers. And you were kind of saying these static languages have a problem. But it seems to me like what you added in in type providers doesn't, at its core, seem more complex to me than if you really wanted to dig in and learn how like Python works, you know, it, it, uh, the semantics it, of it. It, 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 so. it is. Writing a, writing a type provider is mm -hmm. uh, a good one, is a challenge. Is a challenge. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's it's certainly doable for most people who are using F sharp. It's not an impossible challenge, but you do have to split the world into a static point of view on the world and a dynamic point of view on the world. Okay? And it was interesting when I was uh, I had a session with Guido van Rusten from Python, then, and we were talking about language constructs, and and we even just got like to record types in F sharp, and he said, "Oh, that's like a dictionary." And I said, and I was thinking to myself. Yeah, that's the static view on a dictionary. And we've got a dynamic thing called a dictionary. And, and in our world, we separate these things. But in the Python world, they're just one thing. It doesn't, it's like, it's just like a just look up table. And, uh, and so in the static world, you're always creating these kind of two static views of things and the dynamic views of things and trying to stat statify as much information as, as you know as, as you can. And that, that, that runs through type providers as well. And it's actually quite a tricky form of programming uh, that you have to do. And it's definitely way harder than the Python programmers experience, which is fluffing up some Python objects and providing them across. And those objects happen to have the right properties which represent the database columns or something. I think, yeah, I'm not, I, it, it's, it's easier. It's, I remember doing Tickle TK program. I've done, I haven't done a lot of Python programming, but Tickle TK has kind of similarities as well. And you just throw around and fluff up and create information and completely. And then you go back later from a strongly typed point of view and try and give a typing to what you've done. Yeah, it's just, just impossible, right? You can't, it's, it's, it's all sorts of programs. You, you never write in a strongly typed world. And so, no, we strongly type languages have a problem in information rich spaces. This is this solves part of the problem. It solves it in a way that you you don't give up on the ben all the benefits of, of static typing. Uh, you, you it maybe makes you even more productive in things like screen scraping um, and or data access. But no, we've got a we've got a problem. I like to admit it where we have problems because we do. There is a question in the um, in the chat. Uh, Evgeny is asking, "What is the future of typed providers?" There are a bunch of suggestions relating to extending computations. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, so, by far and away, the most important thing we have to do is allow you to provide types as parameters to type providers. Okay, so then that allows us, for instance, you, know, you can make a record type and then you have the type provider provide all the join, all the possible um, uh, uh, joins on that type with another type, for example. And, uh, uh, and many, uh, it can provide you with a, a column based you can provide it with a record type and then it provides you with a column based view on that type or there, there are many other examples or use that type as a as a as a proto scheme of access with the database and so on so that allows type providers to be less focused on external access and more on sort of the internal traditional internal meta programming kinds of things and we absolutely need to make that it's just a lot of work to make sure that works properly, especially in a setting where you're cross-compiling, which 
I want to ask a spin on that question that I was glad it got asked because it's one that was on my mind. But on a related note, like taking this one step back, as an end user, not as an implementer, what are the main limitations of type providers? Like if you have the best type provider that, that's really well implemented, still you probably find it's limited. And it's not, you just kind of were getting at some of the things that maybe are hard to do, like joins and so forth. But what uh, are the things where people can't do that you wish they could? So the, 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 the main problem tends to be that people who implement type providers don't do a complete job on doing that. Okay. Uh, so, for example, one, and we, in the paper, it's actually a tech report, the, in, the uh, information rich programming for the internet era or whatever we called it, we listed out kind of a path of things you need to consider. And so one of them is, for example, if you access a resource from the web, you should be able to take a local copy of that resource and then use that as a schema to kind of pin that down to make sure that your code will continue to compile and work. So that, and then we push that off to the type provider author to do that and allow the kind of local resources as uh, and a lot of type provider authors don't get to that point where they do that. And that makes the type provider compelling for the in the beginner samples, but then useless in production samples. And um, uh so it's it's not like i'd like type writers to be able to do more apart from the things that were mentioned in the question uh it's more that there's they can do so much it's just it becomes a job in itself okay to be an expert at making sure a type writer does all the things it's meant to do so in in fact you become an information space engineer Okay, and it's it's like a specialty, a bit like a verification engineer or a testing engineer or something like that. It it, it becomes such a specialty in itself, uh, and it's it's a, it's a lovely form of programming, very fascinating. But it's um, it, yeah, it, it can mean that that they just end up incomplete or unmaintained or with a big back bug backlog or or something. So in fact, in some ways, it's too powerful as a mechanism. Oh, there are other little things like. Really, oh, it's some of the things you mentioned, Nico, absolutely. So the idea that a type provider can provide the developer assists, you'll see that uh, because we're providing types, we get to provide autocompletes uh, based on type information. But there's, uh, we also provide a go-to definition for a type provider, so it can kind of take you to a web page or something that um, to open the, the view on, of that data, the external source. Um, but uh, there are, there's just the usual range of assists in um, which it feels like the type provider author should be able to do. So at the moment they can't provide warnings, they can only provide errors. At the moment they, they can't provide particularly rich hover tips. You can provide some, but not enough. But there, there's just in a modern ID, ID environment, it's just all the full range of assists. And in fact, all of those should be sort of configurable by these add-in components. Which then a, builds uh, on the other problem, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. oh, it's, you have a lot more work to do now. Sorry, Jan, go on. Y yes. Just one tiny add on to this are there situations where pro the end user may want to refine the outcome of the type provider, say, for mm. instance, knowing that a type has you know, bigger range or you know, more constraints? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure there are. I mean, every absolutely the inference process will be incomplete. Often, I mean, it, it, the CSV type provider, for example, I'll just bring it up on the screen. I'm still... I can imagine that sometimes you just don't see enough values to to get a good. Uh, um... Yeah, or you see too many, right? like the type provider handles the general case, but you happen to know that. <laughs> so if you look here, this is the CSV type provider. Okay, so in the static parameters that you give, you give the sample primarily, but you can see the range of things, uh, optional parameters here. Uh, so you can, uh, you can, for instance, give the sample, that's fine. You can give a schema, you can say what separators you wanna use, you can say how many rows to skip, you can say whether the thing has headers, what encoding, uh, what culture to use and so on. So that's a well-engineered type provider, but that's a lot of different tweaks and knobs to document and test on how you view these external information sources. 
of course, anything that's going to do this is going to be like this. It doesn't matter if it's a code generator in C Sharp or something in Rust or a library in Python. In fact, what we probably did to get this list was to go to the Python library for reading CSV files and, and look at all the options that they give and decide which of those accept the static, uh, affect the static view on, on, uh, on the world. Uh, so that's kind of what I was getting to about Gamma Nort doesn't speak your language. <laughs> it's like Gamma Nort. It's being organized, but it's full of nits and horrible kind of bits and pieces. And, and the job of the typewriter is to mediate all of that, but that can be a big job. There's a question in the chat. Is it actually simple to write a type provider like in Python? It seems to you have to fight with magic attributes or offload everything to the end users. Uh, I mean, like in Python, as I said, the, if the equivalent code in Python is just fluffing up some Python objects and providing them a, 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 a across with the right property, no, it's, it's much easier in Python. I won't, I'm not going to say that this stuff, it, it, but Python loses all the static type in those contexts. So this is an attempt to maintain static typing. And in fact, as Python gets more typing, this, be, this stuff becomes relevant back in the Python world, becomes relevant in the TypeScript world. I mean, if you say, if you want TypeScript to access uh, JSON APIs, APIs providing JSON, you've got to start doing this kind of thing. You got to start generating TypeScript mm -hmm. types representing that kind of world. And uh, so, so everybody- this is why uh, TypeScript is so powerful, right? Its type system is remarkable. Um, but, um, it, it, it is, but it still can't make a web request, for example, in doing type checking. And you got to think, so you've got to pin down that schema and probably copy and paste it into your code. And that's fine for JSON APIs. That's usually fine. But, but you know, there some of those JSON APIs are getting bigger and bigger and it's uh, scalable and so on. Probably is for TypeScript because people will actually document their APIs by using a TypeScript by using a sample or something. Yeah, but TypeScript is getting more and more powerful, uh, and that is a problem for TypeScript at the type level. It's uh, it's hitting all those problems of type level programming because of that. We may have probably one more question. Jacques asks about uh, the the risk of having a zoo of type providers. He says, "Is there for a given source type? Is there a single provider or?" Can you have many? Uh, the, the, F, the F sharp, I mean, you can have many. You can absolutely. Uh, and a single provider can provide multiple views on data and knobs and tweet and parameters and things to tweak the views. Um, the F sharp universe isn't so big that we, I mean, there are quite a few different SQL ones, for example. The F sharp data tends to do a good job on the core set of type provided core set of data constructs I've mentioned JSON, CSV, XML. But yeah, in uh, absolutely the, the, the whole aim is to have a zoo of type providers and to let it be a Darwinian process of kind of which one's the best. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's how that's what we want. We want there to be hundreds of them there, even more so if there's four source generators in C sharp or in the Rust universe. Uh, any last questions? Uh, I, I, I want to say hello to Sophia, who was the, uh, who I see is online, and who was the um, uh, big hello, who was my supervisor for my PhD topic, and, and also uh, got me into the world of object programming, uh, uh, coming from the functional world, and therefore uh, kind of helped me navigate through to the design of F sharp in some ways in the middle. Hi, Don. Very exciting to see uh, all these uh, aims and the aim also that the people should be able to use, make best use of the systems without being category theorists. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I'm glad that resonated. It resonates with some and some other people are not so happy that the march of history is not necessarily leading towards uh, ab abstract mathematics in, in all, in, in every way. All right. On those uh, those good words, I would like to thank Nico and Don. Thanks for the talk, the discussion. This was great. Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, there'll be more rebase soon. So 
stay tuned to on this. Yeah, and Nico, um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, likewise. It was great. Thank you. All. Thanks, John. Pleasure.